Well, we're here to talk about the anniversary of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. And I think it's important to start out by saying that the FCIC did a tremendous service documenting the causes of the financial crisis. As the final report concluded, the financial crisis, and this is the quote, was avoidable. The result of human action and inaction, not of mother nature. Now, as a mother myself, I appreciate that conclusion. <laughs> um, but it really bears underlining. The FCIC concluded that the problems were those created by bad policies and messed up incentives. And that is both the good news and the bad news. It is the good news because it means we can fix this. It is the bad news because it means a handful of giant Wall Street banks can spend hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that the game stays rigged in their favor. And that is why we are here today for this panel discussion. I think the best way to understand the crash of 2008 is to look at how the government responded to earlier crashes. You know, from the 1790s to the 1930s, we were in booms and busts, and they just happened. And by and large, the government stood by and watched them happen. Speculators might win or might lose, but the problem was that everyone else, like small businesses and farmers and workers, got dragged down by those crashes. But that was just how it was. When the markets crashed in 1929, however, policymakers stepped up, the government stepped up, and it said, we can do better than this. And so they changed the laws to make sure that excessive risk-taking and speculation on Wall Street couldn't push the economy over a cliff. And they, worked, they developed three major tools that they worked with. First, put cops on Wall Street just like cops on Main Street. The new agency, the SEC, was charged with enforcing basic rules of the market. Second, make it safe to put money in banks. FDIC insurance created security for families and a lot of stability in the banking system. And third, make banks boring. Glass-Steagall built a wall so banks couldn't use government-guaranteed deposits for high-risk speculation. Now, those three things, and they worked. For half a century, there wasn't a serious financial crisis. Instead of that roughly 15-year cycle we've had from 1790 to, the, to 1929, we go half a century without a serious crisis. Better yet, the financial sector did its part to help produce sustained, broad-based economic growth that benefited millions of people across the country. This is when America built its great middle class. Then, in the 1980s, a new political wind swept across the country. It was called deregulation, but it really meant fire the cops. Not the cops on Main Street, but the cops on Wall Street. And it has sort of two working parts to it. The first part was that the Fed and the other bank regulators just looked the other way as financial institutions invented creative new ways to trick their customers. It was first through credit cards, then through mortgages, then home equity lines of credit, and then all kinds of inventive financial products. The second was that that wall between high-risk trading and boring banking was not down, and Glass-Steagall was eventually repealed. Washington turned a blind eye as risks were packaged and repackaged, magnified, then sold to unsuspecting <laughs> pension funds and municipalities and all kinds of folks. Not long after the cops were blindfolded and the big banks were turned loose, the crash of 2008 hit the American economy. A crash that the Dallas Fed has estimated cost this country a collective $14 trillion. Now, the moral of this story is simple. Without basic government regulation, financial markets don't work. That is just an empirical fact, clearly observable. 
from the 1790s to 1930, from the 1930s to the 1980s, and from the 1980s leading into the crash of 2008. For too long, the conventional wisdom has been that you can be for rules or you can be for markets, but you can't be for both. And that's simply not true. Rules are not the enemy of markets. Rules are a necessary ingredient for healthy markets, for markets that create competition and innovation. And as we saw in 2008, rolling back the rules and firing the cops can be profoundly anti-market. We need rules, but not all rules promote innovation or promote competitive markets. So what tests should we use to make sure that rules promote healthy competition and innovation? Well, we can start with two principles that worked well for more than 50 years during the Great Depression and coming out of the Great Depression. And, and these are, you'll see, pretty basic principles. First, financial institutions shouldn't be allowed to cheat people. You know, pretty shocking, but, uh, and would require a shift in some business models. But first one is, financial institutions shouldn't be allowed to cheat people. Second one, financial institutions shouldn't be allowed to force taxpayers to pick up their risks. The departure from just those two basic rules in the 1980s and 1990s paved the way for the 2008 crisis. Our best hope for stopping the next crisis is to return to those basic principles. No cheating people and no pushing the risks off to taxpayers. Judged against those two principles, you know, Don Frank made some real progress. But there is more to be done. Look at the first goal. No more cheating people. Dodd-Frank took a very powerful step toward honest markets with the establishment of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is a new agency. They gave the tools, the expertise, and the responsibility for making sure that financial markets work well for consumers. This is real change, and it is working. The agency has now returned more than $11 billion to over 25 million consumers who were cheated on credit cards, checking accounts, and other financial products. You know, that's government that works for the people. Can I have an amen on that? Amen. amen. <laughs> but cheating still happens, uh, and we need to fix that. Right now, the car loan market looks increasingly <coughs> like the pre-crisis housing market. Lots of subprime lending, lots of uh, predatory lending, discriminatory lending practices, increasing repossessions. And while the CFPB has oversight over mortgages and credit cards and checking accounts, it doesn't have complete oversight of the car loan market because the lobbyists persuaded Congress to carve out car dealers. Now, we can fix that by giving the consumer agency oversight over deceptive car loans. So there's a place we can make it better. Second, it's time for the Justice Department and the SEC to get serious about enforcing our laws against financial fraud. Even when financial institutions engage in blatantly criminal activity, these agencies don't take big financial institutions to trial. Not ever. Instead, they let lawbreakers pay a fine and make a promise to do better in the future. Last week, I released a report. The title of it says it all. It's called Rigged Justice. It's the first in what's going to be an annual series highlighting some of the most egregious cases of weak federal enforcement during the preceding year. Of the 20 settlements highlighted in the report, six were with big banks. I think the lesson is clear. Big banks are getting off easy when they break the law, and unless that changes, they will keep breaking the law. Now, those are two steps that can help reduce cheating in financial markets. But what about the second goal? Making sure that financial institutions can't push their risks off to taxpayers. 
the idea that no institution should be too big to fail. Again, Dodd-Frank changed the landscape. It helped bring back some market discipline through living wills and orderly liquidation authority. And it reduced system-wide risk by imposing higher capital standards. Those are the important steps, and they are well worth defending. But get serious. Dodd-Frank did not end too big to fail. The Fed and the FDIC reported in 2014 that 11, 11 of the biggest banks in this country were still so risky that if any one of them started to fail, they would need a government bailout or they would risk taking down the American economy again. So what do we do about too big to fail? Simple. We break up the biggest banks. Cap the size of the biggest financial institutions and adopt a 21st century Glass-Steagall Act that rebuilds the wall between commercial banking and investment banking. You know, I laugh when people treat this like it's some kind of radical idea. You know, the, whenever, uh, uh, in the past, when companies have started to undermine a functioning market, the government has routinely broken them up. From the railroads, to Standard Oil, to AT&T, and other countries, like the United Kingdom, have moved aggressively since the crisis to break up the banks by separating high-risk trading from safer deposit-taking and lending. We have 50 years of evidence from our own country that this approach will help make financial systems safer and grow the economy. These ought to be proposals that appeal to both Democrats and Republicans. Everyone, regardless of party affiliation, should want simple structural rules that produce safer, more competitive financial markets. So here we are, five years since the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission's report, seven years from the crisis. We know what changes we need to make our financial system safer. And we know what to do to make sure our markets don't work just for powerful insiders, but work for everyone else. We know we need to strengthen the rules to prevent cheating, 